So one of the things about puppetry that's really interesting is that the main point of the art form is to take something that's not living and convince the audience that it is. With, with uh, puppet forms where the people are around manipulating the puppet, if we can see the puppeteer, we are reacting to the concentration of the puppeteers as well. So it's interesting because we're not just seeing the puppet. We're seeing the overall picture. And like in social, you know, social groups and things, if someone's looking at something, we will look. If you're concentrating on something, we will concentrate on the same thing. And we see that um, just as human beings, you know, for survival techniques. But it's part of the magic of what happens when we have a puppet on stage. Um, uh, and I think that, you know, people sort of discount the puppeteer in the puppet performance, but uh, primarily because we've all grown up with TV puppets. So the TV puppets, the puppets on screen, but you don't see the puppeteer uh, unless, unless it's a form like ventriloquism, which is sort of what we're gonna talk about. One of the interesting things about ventriloquism, which doesn't surprise me at all, is that its origins are basically in like necromancy and prophecy and, and weird uh, uh, set of occult stuff. Um, one of the original famous, uh, the, the word is in, oh, here we go. And gastromyths, and gastromyths is, is the stomach speaking. And um, if you know from your Greek literature about the Pythia and the Oracle of Delphi, um, there you go. She was one of the first uh, uh, ventriloquists because she was channeling, supposedly channeling Apollo. And oftentimes it would make all these weird noises. And in some ways, uh, the voice was coming from somewhere else, sort of. And um, so uh, uh, the, um, the, the temple itself, you know, she's sitting in sort of this cauldron thing that's over this large chasm where smoke and stuff is coming up. And they, they did apparently burned like barley meal and laurel leaves and who knows other kinds of leaves, maybe ganja and other kinds of stuff. So people were really like, whoa, what's going on? And she would channel these, these uh, oracular prophecies and everything like that um, up, until, up until about 393 BCE, uh, because um, uh, when, when all the pagan shrines were eliminated. But um, oftentimes, you know, it was, it was every time the priestess died, they had a new Pythia. And then, then eventually, you know, people got so hyped up about the want to see the Pythia that they had like several Pythia. <laughs> and like every year they would have a new Pythia so, you know, they could bring more people. In. So you got, you got to be pretty much like entertainment, you know, like the Wicked Witch can, can end up being. Um, uh, then there was, it, it's interesting because most of these occult versions of things are all women. So of course, um, there's a, uh, as, as it comes down to the ages, we also have uh, occult versions of ventriloquy in witchcraft. Um, and um, many people ended up suffering a lot because they were ventriloquists back then. Um, you know, the spirits of the dead talking to uh, talking to things from other places, you know, um, up until like, you know, in the, in, in the, um, the early 18th century, there was, a, um, there started to be, well, actually, like 1850s and stuff, you know, when, when spiritualism and seances mm -hmm. and stuff like that started happening, that was another part of it was ventriloquism. Um, mm -hmm. although, uh, when it started to make its transition into vaudeville and actual legitimate entertainment, um, first was in Europe, not here. So in like 1750s or so, there were people that were traveling around that were doing ventriloquism, but with like their hand or with like talking to the things around. It wasn't necessarily quite, um, uh, but they were all men. So um, 
during the time that ventriloquy was done by uh, by women for whatever their reasons were, either in seances um, or um, they were always in seances or witchcraft or something occult and were very suspect and treated thus. Uh, and it wasn't until the guys took it over and started doing it as entertainment, um, even though, you know, like one of the music hall guys um, had some familiar, he called it his familiar little Tommy that he talked to. Um, so, you know, a thousand people in a theater and he would talk to the spirit that would be there. That was fine. Guy talking to a spirit was fine. Um, uh, hmm. So, in about the 1830s, um, uh, that's when people started using dummies. I mean, when they actually started using a doll or something. Um, there's an interesting painting by William Hogarth of um, elections in, um, in England in the 17, it's like 1780, 1750s, 1760s. Um, and there's a guy sitting, there's a whole bunch of people doing stupid things for the election and one of the guys has his hand sort of dressed as a person and he's like this so they think that's like the first visual of an actual ventriloquist um, so in the music hall uh, it first came from the UK and then we ended up um, having uh, music hall people um, doing ventriloquy um, uh, and uh, one of the most famous ones was a guy named Edgar Bergen. So now how many people know Edgar Bergen? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Charlie McCarthy, mm -hmm. right? Um, Edgar Bergen uh, was 11 when he uh, learned how to do ventriloquy. Um, and he... Uh, got a he got this little pamphlet i guess and he learned from the little pamphlet it said like how to score your voice and so um and uh he ended up finding a very famous ventriloquist at the time a guy named henry lester or harry lester and harry lester was really impressed by him so he gave him lessons on being a ventriloquist and that's how edgar bergen ended up um, uh, getting onto the circuit and starting to work. He ended up in 1919, he asked a, uh, a wood carver whose name is Theodore Mack, who was a famous um, designer, to make him a sculpture of an Irish kid, newspaper boy that he knew. And that Irish kid, whose name is McCarthy, <laughs> became his lifelong companion. Um, uh, and it's interesting because um, I, am, I am moving through Edgar Bergen because the person I want to get to, of course, is Sherry Lewis. Um, and uh, it's interesting because one of the sort of uh, historical things about Sherry Lewis is that she was taught ventriloquy by uh, a guy named what's his name? John, John W. Cooper, uh, John Walcott Cooper, was a black ventriloquist. Um, he was performing during the 1900s, 1920s. Um, and he always made this joke that his dummy, whose name was Sam Jackson, that Sam Jackson was a cousin of Charlie McCarthy. And the reason was because uh, Sam Jackson, the puppet that, that John, John Cooper used, was carved by Theodore Mack. So the same person. Mm. And uh, anyway, so Edgar Bergen um, ended up uh, interesting. The really interesting thing about Edgar Bergen is that he was he did the regular, you know, like the, the same kind of circuit that Sally would be doing. He did the Chautauqua circuit. He did, he did all of these things because um, he was coming out of Chicago. And um, he was a huge success. He played the Lyceum Theater in Chicago. Um, and then he was um, performing and a, a person that knew Noel Coward saw him and recommended him to go and perform in the Rainbow Room. And then 
when he was there, some producers saw him. And remember, this is this is like um, this is like 19, 1928. Uh, the producers saw him, and they said, "Oh, we want him for a show." Well, what is it? A radio show. So Edgar Bergen, <laughs> yeah, exactly, I mean... exactly. So Edgar Bergen from um, basically he was on a radio entertainment show that was hugely successful called the Chase and Sanborn Hour. It was um, uh, it was um, uh, produced by San yeah Sanborn Bank or something like that. You know, it, it was like you know the B of A Hour basically, and. Um, uh, Charlie McCarthy and Edgar Bergen were on. They made their first appearance uh, in 1936. And he was a regular and stayed on the show from 37 to 1956. A ventriloquist on a radio show. Wow. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, they, 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 this is still one of those like historical puzzlements. People are like, he was like the most listened to show. Um, and in fact, it's interesting because there was a little story about how uh, he sort of saved the United States because he was on the same night as War of the Worlds that Orson Welles had put on War of the Worlds. And so because he was so popular, half of the audience was listening to him and not listening to War of the Worlds. Yeah. But there was some little music glitch where there was something going on on his show, and people turned away, and then they got World of Worlds and they freaked out. So, oh, no. um, but um, <laughs> uh, but it but it is because uh, they said that um, Charlie McCarthy was a person for the audience, and so they enjoyed the 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 dialogue. You know, I mean, the comedic timing was awesome and and what the sketches they wrote and all of this thing were very very entertaining and so the fact that he was being a, a ventriloquist on a radio program apparently you know it didn't quite the irony was not phasing the people back then but um you know he did go on afterwards to do television and stuff because but um uh, that was the time period that he was the most famous really was being on the radio show they actually had to have a cartoonist sort of like draw a Charlie McCarthy character mm. um, because for the same reason, you know, it's like everybody just thought he was a person. Um, mm. uh, so getting to the person that I, I'd like to talk about is, is, um, is Sherry Lewis. I think Sherry Lewis is, is, uh, is, <laughs> is a, a very appropriate to a Dybbuk production because A, she's Jewish. Um, uh, she was born in 1933 in the Bronx to uh, Anne and Abraham Hurwitz. Her real name was Phyllis Naomi Hurwitz. Um, and her father was an educational, uh, an education professor at Yeshiva University. And he was also a magician. So, uh, in fact, Mayor LaGuardia uh, named him New York City's official magician because during the Great Depression, he was like, um, uh, I guess he did, he did a lot of um, stuff educationally as well, uh, you know, using performance for education, which is probably why Sherry Lewis was so involved in that. Um, uh, but she ended up learning magic tricks, acrobatics, juggling, the violin, the piano, how to sing, how to tap dance, how to do uh, baton, acrobatics, you know, all of this stuff because her parents. Um, and um, like I said, she, uh, she was noted as learning ventriloquism as part of her lineup of stuff, right? You just throw ventriloquism in. That from, uh, from this very famous black ventriloquist, um, who also, he also went by the name of Hezekiah Jones, but uh, 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 John Cooper Jr. Um, so that would be fascinating. I mean, I was looking, you know, you get down a rabbit hole, you start going, uh, his, his experience was really fascinating too, because, um, you know, like the, the black vaudeville actors, 
were given the opportunity to perform in front of white audiences because the white vaudeville performers had gone on strike. So, um, whole nother story. <laughs> Anyway, Sherry Lewis made her television debut. She, she basically learned how to do, again, ventriloquism at the age of like 13. And um, uh, she uh, basically uh, 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 fooled her father into thinking that she had locked her sister in a trunk by throwing her voice and making it seem like she'd locked her sister in a trunk. And so her father said, oh, you know, when he found out that she, you know, he opened the trunk and the, nobody was in there, then he said, oh, guess what? We got to give you some lessons. So um, uh, in 1952, uh, she went on the Arthur Godfrey Talent Scout Show, and she won first prize. Uh, she did have a, a, a big clunky wooden doll. She had two wooden, you know, characters back then when she started. Um, and, and then she also, uh, she got a job, her first job was in 1953. She ended up taking over as host of a show called Cartoon Club. And from there she went on to appear on Captain Kangaroo. And one of the things that the producers said to her was, you can't, you know, you're small, you're little, you're kind of cute, you're red haired, you can't have this big old clunky dummy. So she made some puppets. <laughs> and that's where she got Lamb Chop, uh, Charlie Horse, and Hush Puppy. Um, and uh, the three of them actually had been, had been around almost all this time. Um, uh, Lamb Chop made her debut on Captain Kangaroo as well. Um, and uh, then from there, she ended up with her own show. Uh, she, from Cartoon Club, she ended up with Sherry and Friends, uh, which turned into a show called Sherry Land, uh, which ran through 1959. And um, then, you know, the Sherry Lewis show replaced Howdy Doody, who was also a puppet, right? And when Sherry Lewis's show had run from 1960 to 1963, um, it got pushed off by the chipmunks. So it's interesting that cartoons ended up taking, taking the variety show of the live puppet and, and, uh, and pushing them off the air. Um, but like during the time the Sherry Lewis show was on, um, she had like Dom DeLuise was a guest star. Margaret Hamilton from The Wizard of Oz was a guest star. Uh, it also won a Peabody Award. Uh, Fred Gwynn from The Munsters was also a guest star. Uh, it won a Peabody Award. Um, and then, you know, that could be laurels enough. But then she decided, and I'm sorry that Kai is not here, she went on to, uh, with her husband, to write an episode of Star Trek. And uh, she was supposed to be in it, but the producer said that they didn't want her to be in it. So uh, there was another actor that was, that was in it, but anyway. But yeah, so The Lights of Zatar is a, is a Star Trek episode that many people do know and they remember it. And she and her husband wrote that episode. Um, then, you know, during the 60s and um, all through the 80s as well, you know, all the, all the way 60s and 70s, she did tons and tons of children's shows, children's appearances. Um, uh, there was, um, you know, uh, she had um, gone for a little while to Vegas and was doing performing in Vegas because it just, I, um, she she was playing at the Sahara when the Sahara was there, and she opened for different people. Um, and uh, uh, she said she opened for Milton Berle and other people, you know, like big name headline people. But she was always she said she loved uh, uh, being in Vegas. Um, and then when she came back during the the late eighties and the nineties, she started working on a, a show for PBS, uh, Lamb Chops Play Along. And um, she even did Lamb Chop Special Hanukkah. <laughs> so uh, I want to find that one. Uh, that was in 1996. Um, and that won uh, a Parents Choice Award. And then the cool thing was that she testified uh, before Congress in 1993 um, in support of children's television. And she is 
you know, Lamb Chop is the very first puppet to testify in front of Congress. Um, but she was just a master um, performer. Um, and, and as we've been talking about, you know, the, the ventriloquism thing is really about um, comedic timing, the dialogue, coming up with great material. One of the things that she was able to do was to meld that thing of ventriloquism and puppetry, traditional puppetry, which we always um, are, are, with ventriloquists, with the straight dummy, it's really not always there. It is there because they have to move the head, they have to make the puppet move, but it's that wooden sensation that's not as, you know, lamb chop is so alive um, and it's a sock, right? Or ventriloquism, especially like large audience ventriloquism, is just like magic sleight of hand. You're misdirecting, you're looking where the voice is going to be coming from and making the audience believe that's where it's coming from. So you're looking at the puppet, you're saying this, you know, and but you know, the idea of throwing your voice is really from a, a misdirection. Um, so, uh, but the 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 interesting thing is that the puppeteer who's the ventriloquist is using certain techniques so that it's easy for the audience to think it's coming from somewhere else or think it's coming from the puppet like um a lot of times the puppeteer will make the ventriloquist i keep saying ventriloquist will make the puppet sound a little smaller you know their voice will do it because then the audience knows it's not the adult doing it, you know, so that's a really easy technique. Um, and so a lot of time, Senior Wences, uh, Sherry Lewis, um, uh, Charlie McCarthy is a little different because he's a big doll, right? <laughs> but he's still got a little bit of a boyish sound. Um, and so, you know, one of the things is the way you're animating this puppet, especially like what we're going to do sock puppet, it's small. So the, the, your vocal selection for it, um, you know, you might want to play against type if you want to, but the idea is that you are making the audience uh, buy into the rules of the game, which is, oh, it's small. It's going to have this little kind of funky little voice or a weird voice. Um, you you have you're trying to keep your lips still because a lot of the vocal stuff is coming from your chest and the back of your throat. Um, one of the things I was reading was that you, you put the tip of your tongue up against the roof of your mouth, not on the soft palate but on the hard palate, so that you have space around to make your the air move. So if you're talking, you can talk like this without really making your lips move. Um, I am not a ventriloquist, but that was one of the things. Um, uh, and you want very much to give your puppet a defined personality from the get-go. So the audience immediately knows what to, you know, they know what this is, they know, they know what to expect. Um, again, you can play against type on a, bigger, on a bigger scale when you're doing it for a show or something like that. But uh, for the most part, the... the the, uh, because the sock puppet is a sock puppet, um, you have a lot of, of things that you can play with within the sock, this particular type of puppet. Her name is Mitzi. And one thing about a sock puppet is that you have this mouth that can actually do all kinds of weird stuff, right? And um, hers has hair, so she can like do things with her hair. Um, but your, your hair looking very kind of strange. What do you mean? Your hair is like kind of flopping up. What do you mean? My hair is fine. My hair is fine. I like my hair like this. Yeah, okay, okay. Hang on, wait, what? Hold on. Okay, yes. So one of the things with puppets is that when you are making the words, right? This is all 101, right? You're opening the mouth on the syllables. 
and you don't have to open them on every single syllable, but when you open them, when you open your mouth, if you're opposite, then it'll look weird. So if you're talking and the puppet is talking, you don't have to do every single syllable, but you have to make sure that it's sort of matched up. And I matched up. Okay, Mitzi? Yes? I need you to go away for a second. Okay. One of the things about, about having a hand puppet like this is that what we normally do as puppeteers is that all of our focus is going into the puppet and it's staying there because we're always behind the puppet, right? We're, we're in the background doing the puppet. So all of our energy can be in sort of this one flow. With hand puppets and rod puppets where you're actually a character in the scene, you have to do this thing like you do in, you know, uh, flipping it back and forth, which is, which is actually really difficult. Um, and uh, uh, because you have to come back to you, keep your puppet alive, right? The puppet has to stay alive while you're talking, and then it goes back to this one and the puppet is talking, and then it comes back to you, you know, so that's, it's a little bit different. How are you today? Uh, you know, I'm okay. I've been, I've been, uh, I've been having strange dreams. I think it's this, this whole, this whole quarantine thing. Strange dreams, eh? Tell me more. Fred, I, I, I want people to, to meet you. No, I don't want to meet anyone. No. Oh, I don't know, I'm a sock. You, hey, don't listen to that. You are more than just a sock. Yes. You have an articulatable spine. I don't. Yeah, I guess you're right. You don't. You kind of have like two joints you can move from. Yeah, you think that's fine? No, I don't think it's not fun at all. It hurts a lot. All I can do is move my jaw and my eyes wiggle a lot. I'm so I'm sorry. I I I wish I could help you. Well, you can't. Yeah, I don't I don't know what to do. I feel um I mean, maybe like, like screaming? Why don't you scream? Because it's just, it's, it's, it, first of all, it will really scare my husband, who's sitting right over there. Yeah, scare him. Yeah, it's a good, I, I, I don't want, I don't want to scream. I could scream for you. Yeah. Nobody likes getting older. I don't know. What do you mean you do? You're like a day old. Yeah. So why, what do you even know about getting older? I want to get older. Okay. Oh, well, I'm fun. Yeah, I, well. Because birthday. Um, okay, yeah. Okay, you can play that. Have a party? Well, don't really get to have a party. No? Well, kind of, maybe this time. I have to stay home, though. Maybe, maybe we could do something fun. Maybe we could, like, go outside, drive somewhere safely with a mask. With a mask? Yeah, with a mask. Well, thanks for your wonderful insight. Yeah, you're welcome. Anyone else? Anyone else need some insight? I'm full of insight. 